Have you ever wanted to know what happened to Kintaro Oe at the end of the Golden Boy anime? Yes! Yes! Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. Golden Boy is one of the most classic comedy anime out there. It stars Kintaro Oe, a scholar of life who rides around Japan on his bike, looking for various part-time jobs. For whatever reason, despite completing all his coursework, he dropped out of college for a different kind of study. Kintaro is a man of culture, picking his jobs based on the hot chicks he gets to work with. He's also a total spaz and a screw-up, causing chaos and mayhem wherever he goes. Ultimately, however, he's known as the Golden Boy because he turns every mess he makes into a huge victory, winning over the girls before continuing his journey. He chronicles all his lessons and experiences, appropriate or otherwise, in a precious notebook. In this beloved anime series, Kintaro starts off at a software company where he works under a busty woman who angrily fires him for unplugging their servers. Despite coming into the job with no programming knowledge, he learned so fast that even though he accidentally destroyed all the company's data, he was able to leave them with a superior version of their software. He then takes a job working for a local politician during a re-election campaign. There, he falls in love with the politician's teenage daughter Naoko. Naoko thinks Kintaro is a pathetic, spineless man that she can use as her own toy, but it turns out he's actually playing into it all along. He winds up being the only guy brave enough to stand up to her father, even if it means getting his ass kicked. While working at a noodle shop, Kintaro prevents the owner's innocent daughter, Noriko, from marrying a sleazy con artist. After that, he takes a job at an indoor pool, pissing off the head coach, but ultimately reminding her of the joy of swimming. He then takes a job as an attendant for a noble Japanese family, where he discovers that their daughter, Lady Reiko, sneaks out of the mansion to ride her motorcycle down the mountain pass. She's convinced no real man can satisfy her like the throttle of her BMO baby, so Kintaro tries to race her down the mountain on his bicycle for a chance to score. Through some comically ridiculous stunts, he actually wins, only to fly off a dangerous pitfall. He survives, but his brakes don't work, so he never gets to claim his prize. The anime's sixth and final episode features Kintaro working in an animation studio. Of course, he's attracted to his co-worker Chie, but he's so busy with meeting the studio's deadline, he never makes a move. Instead, he reaches out to the previous five girls for help completing their film, only to peace out on all of them once again. While most everyone is familiar with Golden Boy as an anime, it's easy to forget that the OVA is actually an adaptation of a manga by Tatsuya Egawa, who cameos in the final episode. Licker me up! <laughs> It was always meant to be an episodic series following a set formula. It also wasn't supposed to go on for very long, but the anime's success brought in a lot of demand for Egawa to continue the series. In exchange for returning to the project, he fought for more creative freedom to do whatever he wanted with the story, regardless of whether it was well received or not. Ultimately, while the anime only covers five chapters of the manga, the entire publication continued for an entire 94 chapters, meaning that most people have only experienced about 5% of the overall story. Oh my god! As someone who absolutely adores this anime, I wanted to finally figure out what Kintaro went on to do after he left that animation studio. By actually reading the manga, I fell down a rabbit hole of bizarre artistic expression. It evolves into a more dramatic narrative that, by the end, hardly resembles the quirky, episodic series I came to love. As such, I want to share my experience, so that you, too, can understand the weird and fascinating progression of the Golden Boy manga. First off, the last episode of the anime isn't even in the manga. The studio made that story up as a conclusion of sorts. At the same time, the anime actually skipped a chapter from the manga. In it, Kintaro works at an athletic resort, where he meets a group of promiscuous college tennis players. The resort puts up hidden cameras in the girls' room, and Kintaro discovers how frequently they sleep around with different guys. In the evening, the girls try drifting their car out in the mountains, only to crash into a tree, stranding them in the forest. Two of the girls go to get help, only to hook up with some guys back at the resort, so Kintaro decides to rescue the missing girl, Minako. Huh? I hear the sound of a woman screaming! He catches up to her, and they wait out the night until the fog clears, huddling naked together to stay warm. Just as she starts liking him for not taking advantage of her, she sees the hidden camera footage and blames him. 
In all, the anime and this missing chapter only make up the first volume out of ten. Volume 2 brings us a new set of jobs. First, Kintaro works construction at a university. There, he falls for one of the psych professors and stops her from getting harassed by one of the students. She lets him stay at her place, where she lives with three other beautiful co-eds. Over time, the girls start seducing him and ultimately become his love slaves. In the process, they've been using him as an experimental subject in their study on human arrogance. The moment Kintaro appears unsatisfied by his harem, they ditch him and watch as his rampaging desires make him the next guy to harass the professor. After he's dragged off by campus security, the professor uses the data she collected by sleeping with various guys to write an elaborate paper on people's escalating libido. Turns out, however, Kintaro was aware of the study and beat her to the punch with his own paper on the subject. Clearly, Igawa's already taken things up a notch, with Kintaro actually scoring with the girls he meets. It's a huge departure from the first volume, but thankfully he's just as much a perverted spaz as always. Next, Kintaro works at a disco club and falls for one of the exotic dancers. Captivated by her movements, he wants to learn the secret behind how she's able to attract so many men. In order to study her, he agrees to become her slave, performing all manner of chores for her while being forced to watch as she sleeps with a plethora of men. The moment Kintaro tries to get in on the action, she has one of the men toss him out the window. Kintaro reasons that the dancer learned her seductive techniques through intercourse, and to apply what he learned, he takes to the stage dressed as a woman. He actually winds up stealing the spotlight, causing all the guys at the club to chase him down for a good time. After that, Kintaro works at a concert venue, where he meets an up-and-coming rock vocalist, Yuki. Since he's poor as dirt, she treats him to ramen, and the two wind up living together. She teaches him guitar, and he works construction to make enough money for the band to play. He joins the band, until their producer insists on keeping it a girl-only group. When denied, the producer tries to sabotage their love by hooking Kintaro up with an idol girl, only for Yuki to jump in for a threesome. The idol eventually replaces Kintaro in the band, and after he winds up sleeping with all of the members, he sets them up for success and continues his journey. Next, Kintaro works as the assistant of a famous author, Megumi, only to learn that most of her works are actually written by a team of oppressed ghostwriters. Rather than letting this kill his spirit, the idea of getting bossed around turns him on, and he becomes another of her ghostwriters. In the end, he winds up writing a piece for her that she thinks will totally ruin her career, only to find out it actually won her a coveted prize. Too bad she already chased him away with a frying pan. So far, the manga has been a continuation of its formula. Kintaro visits a place, gets into trouble, fixes it, then leaves. Volume 3, however, switches it up, giving us our first continuous plot arc, as well as what I'd consider to be the series' antagonist. Turns out, back in college, Kintaro became acquainted with a rich, stoic businessman named Kongoji Masamune, and ever since, the two treat each other as rivals. Kongoji has a god complex, where he feels he and his mental fortitude can lead Japan's complacent masses. Aiming to rule over all of Japan, he establishes an erotic cult based on a process called love integration. It's a form of lovemaking in which partners believe they are feeling each other's sensations, truly becoming one with each other. The idea is that, in time, the cult will integrate with him as he takes responsibility for all of their thoughts. It's oddly philosophical, and it comes from Tatsuya Egawa's own political beliefs which bleed right into the story. I told you it gets weird. Anyway, Kintaro gets involved with all of this while running a small Odin cart in the city. There, he meets a man named Masahiko, who is depressed since his fiancée, Reiko, has been indoctrinated to Kongoji's cult. She used to be a sweet, conservative woman, but Kongoji's massive… uh… charisma awakens her more passionate urges. Kintaro tries to salvage Masahiko's relationship by meeting with Kongoji. Kintaro and Kongoji appear to be good friends, but there's actually a lot more tension between them, which we'll discover later on. At any rate, Kongoji starts to think of Kintaro as a genuine threat to his plan, and tries to get Kintaro indoctrinated into the cult as well. He calls upon his maid, a woman named Kyoko Tachibana, to try and seduce Kintaro. Kyoko tries a number of things to exploit Kintaro's innocence. She attempts to frame him for a train groping, but accidentally gets her hand stuck to his pants with the very same glue she meant to use on his zipper. 
She tries to get him into trouble with the Yakuza, only to learn that Kintaro can hold his own in a fight, so long as it's to save a pretty girl. I opened up a can of whoop ass. I used my Kempo training center technique in such a manner as stupid as this. She tries to get him addicted to her body, and perhaps worst of all, she steals his beloved notebook and convinces Masahiko to light it on fire. She does all this while concealing her identity from him. One night, before getting intimate, Kintaro is so emotional that he confesses a key part of his past, that during his third year of college, the love of his life died. Eventually, Kintaro consults Reiko and has her show him the ways of love integration. The idea is that, through kinky intercourse, cultists will be able to integrate their senses with Kongoji, trusting in him as their messiah. Kintaro lets Reiko bang his brains out and reasons that this cult is dangerous. If Kongoji leads them down the wrong path, the entire cult will suffer from a single mistake. He doesn't intend to meet up with Reiko ever again, but Kyoko continues to provoke him. She cheats on him with Masahiko, who in turn convinces all of Kintaro's patrons to attack and burn down his noodle stand. Despite all this suffering, Kintaro doesn't crack. He blames his own lack of knowledge for his failings, neither getting back with Reiko nor Kyoko. Kintaro even comforts Masahiko after the girls ditch him for being incompetent. Once again, Kintaro hops back on his bike and heads out on another journey, this time leaving Kyoko so infatuated with him that she abandons the cult. The arc ends with Kongoji acknowledging him as a worthy rival. Normally, the narrator says that Kintaro may someday save the world, and perhaps Kongoji is the one he saves it from. Let's keep reading to find out. After that crazy plot arc, it's nice to have another standalone episode. Kintaro's newest job is being part of a film crew. There, he gets to meet one of his favorite pinup models and actresses, Misaki, who winds up being a total jerk to her staff. Of course, Kintaro gets off to it. When she complains about the food served on set, Kintaro takes this chance to make her a special bento. Impressed by his cooking, Misaki hires him on as her assistant, which saves the production. He tends to all her prima donna needs and takes her abuse for free, in addition to his job on set. After a while, Kintaro notices that Misaki isn't putting her all into her acting, and he discovers the one hogging all of that passion is the director, who is sleeping with her on the side. Thinking he can improve her acting, Kintaro sabotages her relationship with the director, and it works. She gets frustrated, using her scenes to fulfill her lust. When she finally sees the film, however, she hates how ravenous she looks, and she takes her anger out on Kintaro. She fires him, only to realize that critics love her performance. Behind the scenes, Kintaro was secretly provoking her emotions to match what was needed for the film. Too bad he's already gone. Next up is yet another continuous plot arc. Kintaro starts working as a cashier at a grocery store. There, he encounters a high schooler named Miho, who happens to be a chronic shoplifter. Kintaro confronts Miho, discovering that she has pockets hidden in her skirt so that she can steal shit. He tries to convince her to stop, but when she refuses, he gets her to take him along on her heists. As a reward for cooperating, Miho gives him used pieces of clothing. With a sick obsession to study her more, Kintaro eventually accumulates a full set of Miho's clothing and cross-dresses to infiltrate her all-girls school. Since Miho doesn't attend lessons, he takes this chance to be her substitute, and his disguise is so immaculate that her classmates actually buy into it. In PE class, Kintaro finally shows off his actually polished swimming, and even earns a spot on the swim team. So, how do you like my swimming? Being the equivalent of a college grad, he also aces all of Miho's tests. Instead of being pissed about this, Miho decides to force Kintaro to keep up the act and do all her schooling for her. After running into Miho's mother, Kintaro figures out that Miho became a delinquent after her parents separated. Since Miho lives alone, Kintaro comes by to cook her a proper dinner for the first time in a while. He stays at Miho's apartment while living out her social life at school. Things get complicated when one of the girls, Ayaka, falls for him in disguise. Going along with it, he fully embraces being a girl, entering into a lesbian romance. Not only is all of this illegal, but Ayaka hates men, so he's really deceiving her. Kintaro dominates in athletics, making his peers jealous enough to try and bully him. They force him to clean their unwashed bloomers, which he really enjoys. Their attempts to humiliate him all fail, and he even winds up protecting one of the girls from sleazy photographers. 
One night, while getting frisky with Ayaka, Kintaro catches the swimming instructor about to bang a male physics teacher. The man thanks Kintaro for not ratting him out, but he also tries to take advantage of the situation to sleep with a student. Kintaro kicks the teacher's ass and then cooks him a meal that reminds him of his mother. The sleazy teacher decides to turn over a new leaf and stop his molesting ways. In class, Kintaro preaches about his love for studying, convincing his classmates that they can enjoy school too if they innovate how they learn. This pisses off the teachers, who complain about being criticized, and they relieve their stress by having an orgy with Kintaro when he's not in disguise. More of Igawa's political philosophy blends in here, as Kintaro discusses the education system with the teachers. Clearly, while playing the role of Miho, he's trying to reform the school and its dated teaching, while also giving the girls a sense of drive for their studies. In time, by being Miho, Kintaro winds up sharing his love with Ayaka, another student, as well as the swimming instructor. Impressed by all of this, the real Miho also wants a piece of the action, sleeping with Kintaro as if looking in a mirror. Afterward, Miho expresses a desire to start going to school again. At first, she thinks people only like her because of Kintaro's athleticism and good grades, but she learns that's not the case. She starts to turn her life around, and Kintaro even helps mend her broken relationship with her parents. Ultimately, however, their body-swapping scheme gets found out. The girls catch Kintaro dressing as a girl, and everything is exposed when Kintaro and Miho show up to class at the same time. Kintaro admits to deceiving everyone, letting Miho say that she was forced to comply under duress. He gets beaten up and kicked out of the school, giving Miho the chance to take over the life he built for her. He even uses all the money he made selling panties and such to pay back all the things Miho stole. While obviously doing much of this for his own sick curiosity, he also did everything he could to help reform her and her school. Now, if you thought that was weird, we're about to explore the depths of this iceberg. Kyoko Tachibana, the girl who left Kongoji's cult, goes on to hunt for Kintaro. Following in his footsteps, she sets out to become the Golden Girl. She stops by where Kintaro met Naoko, the daughter of Mayor Katsuda from the anime's second episode. Their city is in peril, as a wealthy family known as the Gokudo Group has put enormous pressure on the mayor to tear up the town's forests and tank its funds on constructing lavish theme parks and other attractions that the Gokudo Group will control. Kyoko works her way into the mayor's family, sleeping with both him and his wife to establish herself as an influential secretary. She wants to save the town from Gokudo's sleazy developments, but neither the mayor nor his wife have the spine to fight back. Thus, she sets her sight on the mayor's daughter, Naoko. Kyoko confronts Naoko and tests her love for Kintaro by giving her pleasure. More specifically, Kyoko eats Naoko out, gaining her as an ally. <laughs> wow. In order to save the town, Kyoko has manufactured a highly realistic VR simulator that projects people's fantasies. Through mass hypnosis, she hopes to undo the Gokudo group's influence over the town. Their greatest enemy, however, is the Gokudo heiress, Lady Takako, who seems to have all the town's men addicted to her piss, causing them to bend over backwards for a taste of her golden water. Takako makes women her underlings by both humiliating and then beautifying them. Specifically, she'll invite women over to her house, feed them laxatives, and keep the doors locked until they soil themselves on the carpet. Only after humiliating these girls does Takako promise to make them beautiful in exchange for serving her. Before long, the entire freaking school has aligned with her. Everyone except Naoko, that is. Thus, Takako targets Naoko, inviting her over to pull that same laxative trick again. Fortunately, Naoko is able to hold out long enough for the butler to open the door by accident, letting her escape to the bathroom. To her surprise, Takako's butler happens to be Kintaro, who's also obsessed with the golden water. Recall that, in episode 2 of the anime, Naoko promised to give herself to him should they ever meet again. As such, she calls Kintaro over to the school so they can bang in the classroom. Takako interrupts the fun, trying to tempt Kintaro back with more of her golden water. Kyoko then shows up, finally revealing to Kintaro that she was Kongoji's maid back when he was running that noodle stand. The three women pressure Kintaro to decide which of them is most important, and he chooses Naoko. Despite this, he continues on as Takako's butler, which Kyoko suspects is part of some larger plan. Eventually, Naoko and Kyoko then start their counterattack. 
One by one, they lure in the school's students and get them hooked on VR fantasies. Before long, all of the students, including Takako's underling, are lining up to use the VR devices. To regain her control over the city, Takako resorts to imprisoning people and letting them starve before sating their thirst with golden water. This method doesn't work on her underling, however, because she's been hypnotized through VR to cheat on Takako with some studly fantasy man. Jealous of the potential of these devices, Takako orders Kintaro to go in and test the VR simulations before reporting back to her. If you haven't noticed, all of this VR and golden water crap is yet another philosophical exploration on part of Igawa. He's criticizing how society falls in line like sheep, taking the easy way out, which permits a lot of the world's atrocities. The people's desire for a comfy life of pleasure blinds them from key issues like pollution, nuclear energy, and the loss of Japan's cultural values. Anyway, when Kintaro goes to school to try out VR for himself, Kyoko recalls what he told her about his past, the part about losing the woman he loved. Kyoko suggests that they use the simulator to film that part of his life, and he agrees since it'll let him be with that woman again. The rest of Golden Boy's manga takes place in Kintaro's VR fantasy as he reminisces about his past lover, Yoko Morimura. In the simulation, he meets Yoko for the first time while biking down the countryside. The two bond over the fact that they don't confide in the current system of education, instead preferring to study life through experience. She's gone on many journeys, and explains that people are often indoctrinated into schools, choosing the easy way out instead of seeking knowledge for themselves. In that regard, she thinks dropouts are smarter and braver for seeking an alternative. The two of them begin biking around Japan together, overcoming various dangers, such as being attacked by a friggin' bear in the wilderness. Yoko saves Kintaro by getting the bear's attention and diving into a nearby river. Once they're in the clear, Yoko and Kintaro settle down for the night in a cave. There, they both confess their love for each other. She admires his eyes, as they remind her of a newborn baby ready to discover the world without bias. She also teaches him to French kiss before taking his virginity. Their lovemaking lasts for several chapters. It's surprisingly intimate, until Yoko shows her cooch to him anyway. She takes this chance to lecture Kintaro on the ignorance of society, how governments and the media try to hide the most basic and important biological truths humans have. She then claims that people's ignorance is to blame for dangerous nuclear power plants, and if Kintaro wants to break free from that ignorance, he needs to take a good, hard look between her legs. <laughs> They continue making love for another few chapters, with Yoko stating how intercourse used to be more widely embraced in Japan before Western puritanical values came and declared it impure. In her words, Christianity brainwashed Japan. After they climax, the scene skips to further in the future. Apparently, when they got back, Yoko took Kintaro to the hospital and left him there. Unable to find Yoko, Kintaro goes back to the university. Assuming he was dumped, he continues his school life, meeting a new girlfriend, Kawakami, at a mixer. He stops just short of screwing her, because as he was taught, putting it in is for making babies only. Kawakami angrily leaves him, just in time for Yoko to show up at his apartment. They bang like bunnies while attending classes together, except Kawakami hasn't actually broken up with him, and he freaks out about how to explain that he's living with another woman. It's at this stage of Kintaro's life that he meets Kongoji. Kyoko watches the fantasy play out with curiosity. She'd never met Kongoji at that age, and so she yells at Naoko for interrupting. That's when yet another familiar face shows up. Madam President, Kintaro's boss at the software company in Episode 1, arrives at their lab and accuses Kyoko of interfering with Kintaro's hypnosis. It's somewhat implied that the President may have helped Kyoko develop this weird VR stuff. From their very first meeting, Kongoji is adamant about his plan to rule all of Japan, and by extension, the entire world. He's so sure of himself, with such strong mental fortitude, that he intrigues Yoko, making Kintaro jealous. They have an aggressive debate over dinner, in which Kongoji mocks Kintaro for his naivete. Till now, Kintaro strove to get good grades in school, score a good job, and live a comfortable life. According to Kongoji, this makes him no more than a sheep who goes with the flow and has no ideals of his own. To Kintaro's sadness, Yoko agrees. Yoko and Kongoji both see the established system as complicit in the world's problems, and she becomes enamored by his ambition. 
It's not so much that she feels the same way about things, but rather, Kungoji's charisma is so dominant that she acknowledges him as a man worth her attention. In a desperate attempt to have his own idealism, Kintaro pledges himself to a life of study, but at the moment, he doesn't really know what that means. He has the potential to be an independent thinker, but he still has a lot of growing to do. This is when Kongoji invites Yoko to continue their discussion at his house. Kintaro isn't invited, so Yoko initially declines. Feeling defeated, however, Kintaro foolishly gives up, telling Yoko she should go with him. Thus, Kongoji and Yoko drive off, leaving Kintaro feeling totally cucked. On the way home, Kintaro finds Kawakami waiting for him, and he finally tells her about Yoko, and they break up. In his apartment, Kintaro spends the night wallowing in sorrow, admitting that he ran away from the conversation with Kongoji after having his ideals questioned. Now, he's worried that Yoko might sleep with his new rival. Okay, so if you don't like Netorare, this next part's going to be a doozy. You've been warned. The next morning, Yoko comes home, and while she and Kintaro make love, he still wants to know what happened last night. She starts telling Kintaro that, as expected, Kongoji feels that Yoko is such an independent thinker that she's the only other person he can trust. As such, he wants to bang her brains out with his massive magnum dong, which Yoko admits is the largest one she's ever seen. She's enamored by his massive presence, claiming to have fallen for Kongoji. At the same time, she says her feelings for Kintaro haven't changed at all. The way she sees it, people should not be tied down by relationships. Her body is hers to do with what she wants, and she thinks that makes love more special when you share your body with other people. Before continuing her story, she asks Kintaro what he'd think if she did sleep with Kongoji, and he confesses he's terrified to know the truth. Even though he tries to gather courage, he can't bring himself to hear the whole story, and runs out of the apartment in shame. Outside, he once again runs into Kawakami, who claims that she doesn't mind if he's in love with Yoko, so long as the two of them can also be together. They kiss, making Kintaro feel guilty. He knows he shouldn't let Yoko think for him, but he returns to his apartment anyway, only to find that Yoko has moved out but still wants to tell him the truth. Kawakami catches up, and in misery, they both start banging each other. She doesn't care if that means he's going to try to make a baby with her. Their lovemaking lasts another handful of chapters, until Yoko pops back in to pick up something she forgot. Oh, shit! Kintaro freaks out about being caught, but Kawakami insists they keep going. Yoko asks what Kintaro truly wants, and he says he loves both girls. Yoko won't join, but she will sit down and watch as they finish, which is awkward as hell. Kintaro and Kawakami continue, and Yoko watches while confessing that no, she didn't sleep with Kongoji. Not because she didn't want some of that vitamin D, but because Kongoji was trying to become one with her. On a philosophical level, she doesn't think that's possible. Fundamentally, she doesn't believe in people becoming one like that, meaning she's ultimately opposed to Kongoji's plan. She claims to still love Kintaro, even though he went out and started banging another chick in less than an hour after she left. Eventually, Yoko does join in, kissing Kintaro mid-intercourse, when suddenly the power goes out on the simulator. The manga actually ends here, with Kintaro saying he wants to keep drawing, which might be a metaphor for Tatsuya Egawa no longer being able to produce the series. I've been told his direction for the series tanked its ratings, so his publisher told him to wrap the entire thing up in three chapters, which is asking a lot. To an extent, the manga became Egawa's soapbox for political issues, and there's even a rumor that he ended the series with a power outage because he was receiving backlash for criticizing nuclear energy. In either case, Egawa never intended for the series to go on this long, and so he used it as an artistic experiment that I find really crazy. Now that he's gone down this path, though, I would have liked to see some things wrapped up. How did Yoko die? It definitely seems like, in the long run, there would be a more profound confrontation between Kintaro and Kongoji. Given this manga wrapped up in 1998, though, I'm pretty confident we'll never get those answers. Bizarrely enough, a few years later, Egawa returned to this story in the form of Golden Boy 2, which is a really obscure piece of media that's only recently earned itself a fan translation. If you want to keep up with it, you can follow a page called Kintario on Twitter, but so far they've only gotten three chapters out. This new series does nothing to resolve the previous cliffhanger. Instead, it starts with yet another one of Kintaro's new jobs, except now he's 38, whereas he was between 25 and 26 in the original manga. 
he gets a job at a beauty salon, hoping to put his skills to the test as a hairstylist. Instead, the president of the company fires him. For a moment, he thinks she looks like Yoko and goes in for a kiss, only to get his ass beaten up yet again. So there you have it. The well-beloved six-episode anime OVA only represents a small fraction of a larger story that, ultimately, came to an abrupt end, but not before throwing many more adventures at us. I personally find it fascinating just how far the narrative progressed, and how it evolved into a completely different thing from what the anime delivers. I hope you've enjoyed this dive into the continued adventures of Kintaro Oe. Let me know what you think of this crazy series in the comments below. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. VideoGamer75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, The Nonchalant Ostrich, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai1983, Lord Omaguden, Freebrick, RNG or Shuffles1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Link Pendrago, Observer Bellis, Flash Daniel, Elden Yarbro, Horseman of Justices, James Hewitt, Uncanny EXP, Matthew McAfee, Game King352, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, Succubus Sakura, Normace, Jonathan Padua, The Taz 96, President Irna Vladimirovna Putina, Maxwell's Demon, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much.